Good morning, everybody. So uh, today we're looking at the Apostles' Creed. I've got up my phone. I'm not checking my texts. I'm not that important. Uh, and uh, we're looking at the Apostles' Creed because, actually, um, I've been here for three and a half years, and in three and a half years that I've been here, um, I've never read out the Apostles' Creed in a service. It's just never happened. It might have happened in individual service, uh, services, but at the 10 o'clock uh, or our morning services, we've never done it. And uh, w- uh, part of the uh, bishop's uh, issue with some of the stuff that we were doing was that we were missing some things out. So it just made me look at our communion service, and actually I realized that we hadn't done the Apostles' Creed, but I couldn't just... Well, two things. I didn't want to just bung in the Apostles' Creed, assuming everyone knows what the Apostles' Creed is. So I thought we need to teach on the Apostles' Creed before we use the Apostles' Creed. I was thinking that maybe we use it like once a month or something. I just hope the bishop doesn't watch this. Uh, um, because also, I, I keep saying, this, uh, this service has to work for us. And actually, the last thing we want is... So I, when I did my curacy... Um, I, we had, I had three churches in my curacy, and one of the churches was right out in the sticks. It was right in the middle of nowhere, and it was ancient. And the people that went there, the same five people that went there, had been going there all their lives. And it was in Old English, so they were speaking like pirates as they went through the Book of Common Prayer, world without end. And at, at the very uh, and we were in the West Country, so they really did sound like pirates. But but one of the people there had been doing this all his life, and I, it was brand new to me, uh, doing the Book of Common Prayer. So I was there in all my frillies, and I was doing this thing that I, uh, in this language that I didn't really understand because it was old English that no one speaks unless you're a pirate. Um, and, uh, but the guy in the front, he knew it off by heart. He didn't need to look at any of it, he just knew it. And so he would stand up, and I think he was just desperate to get home to eat his lunch. This guy would go 100 miles an hour. This old bloke was there, going, just you know, spitting over everyone. And I, I said, okay, the next time I had to do it, I said, okay, what I want to do is I want you to work at my pace because I'm missing what's being spoken here, and surely these words are there to enable us to meet with the living God. When someone's been doing the same thing for 50 years, that's really hard to try and break that rhythm. But it was about breaking the rhythm to come back to God. And ultimately, what I don't want is us to get so used to something like the Apostles' Creed that you don't even have to really connect with what you're saying. You just try out the words. That sucks. That's religion. We are called to relationship. And actually, what the Apostles' Creed has got is real depth and richness. So, I just what I'm going to—that's just a bit of a backdrop to why I'm going to be speaking about it this morning. Um, but the reason it was written is so it was written like in the third or fourth century, and it was written almost as an apologetic to show this is what we believe, because. These people were becoming Christians out of all sorts of paganism, out of the occult, out of every sort of Mickey Mouse belief you can imagine. That's what they'd grown up with. And all of a sudden, they've had an encounter with Jesus Christ. They have been filled with the Holy Spirit. They are on cloud nine. They wanted to run with God. Do you remember when you first found Jesus, when your eyes were first opened, when your heart was first filled, you wanted to just run up a mountain and scream at the top of your lungs, didn't you? I did. (laughs) I still do. Don't be an egg. Okay. Um, uh, uh, But you know what I mean? And these guys want to do that, but they don't know what they believe. When I first believed, I was in a Baptist church in New Zealand. I had come straight out of darkness. My life was sinful. I had come straight out of that into this Christianity that I knew nothing about. I'd had an encounter with Jesus Christ. I got, a week later, I got filled with the Holy Spirit. I didn't even know who the Holy Spirit was. And I was like flying, man. And I knew nothing, absolutely nothing. 
I was making mistake after mistake. I had no idea what we believed as Christians. All I knew was, I was at the beginning of this journey. I was reading my Bible. I couldn't put it down. I was finding out about Jesus. And he's saying, if you're right, I cause you to sin. Pluck it out. Whoa! You've got to be careful. <laughs> and this is the beauty of a church. You go to someone who you think might know. They don't always, let me tell you. But you go to someone who you think might know, and you get, if you go to Disney, you can get something called a fast, uh, you can fast track. And you, so you don't have to queue up like the rest of the Muppets. Boom, you're at the front of the queue. It, a church is a place where you can fast track in your understanding, in your knowledge of what God is doing in your life. And so this was set out to enable each church, because each church is in a completely, it, say, uh, let's just say, Mr. Saga, okay, let's go roll back to like the third century, and we're meeting because we've all just had an encounter with Jesus Christ, Paul the Apostle has just come over on his brilliant mission, we would just happen to be there, and boom, we've given our life to Jesus, and we're all meeting up, fantastic, and then you walk out of this place, and it's just paganism everywhere, that you've been doing all your life, rituals that you've been a part of all your life, what do you believe? Someone says to you, what do you Christians believe? This is there to enable you to know what you believe, but to keep you on the straight and narrow too. And also it's there as an apologetic to the world. So I just want to start off with it. I'm just going to pick up on some points, because some points we just trot through are incredibly radical. Initially, I believe, as Rob has been saying, that uh, actually in the Catholic Church they say we believe. Where's Libby? Is Libby there? She's like, where's Libby? <laughs> Hello, my good and faithful servant. <laughs> is, is that true? Do the Catholics say we? Thank you. So, well, thank you very much. You can go back to praying. Uh, so, so, when I decided to do this, this last week, I've been looking at the Apostles' Creed, and I said to Libby, okay, so we need to get that up on a slide uh, instead of the reading. She went, oh, okay, and she just, oh, sorry, we don't need it now, but she just, she just trots it out. She was brought up Catholic, she trots it out, boom, she just knows it. I am an Anglican priest, and I don't know it. Don't, don't throw stuff at me. <laughs> I don't know it as well as she does. So initially, I believe creed is Latin for believe. So when you are saying the creed, the Apostles' Creed, originally uh, scholars thought that the Apostles' Creed was written by the 12 apostles at the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit came upon them. There were 3,000 added to the church that day, and they believed they went back to the upper room to work out what it is that these 3,000 believe. I think that's garbage, and I think a lot of them now believe that it is garbage. Yes, the apostles would have uh, believed everything that we have in the Apostles' Creed, but they would not have just hurried back to write something down when 3,000 had just been added to the church. No. I believe in God. If you filled out a form today, they wouldn't put it on it because it's not politically correct. But if you put on a form today, uh, do you, uh, faith, uh, do you believe, what do you believe in, or some sort of religion, what religion are you? I think the majority of people today would put in, in the Western world, would put in atheist. It's almost like the go-to response. So at the very beginning of what we believe is flying against what the world is believing. I believe in God. Back then, when this was created, there, almost everyone believed in God. There was a God of everything. There was a God to get you through the breakfast, there was a God to get you through lunch, there was a God to get you through dinner. Not a huge statement there. But today, to say, I believe in God, sets you apart. I believe in God, the Father. 
So if you go back in the day when this was created, there were many gods, as I've just said, but they were gods of individual things. The god of thunder, the god of fire, the god of storms, the sun god. They were gods of things. And here, what's being set out is totally and utterly unique. I believe in God, the Father. Can you imagine how that would have come across when you are surrounded by people who believe in gods of some sort of mighty thing and some other mighty thing and something that could just blast you to pieces and we say we believe in God Father. It just speaks of a totally different understanding of who your God is and the relationship that you are expecting to have with this God. The God of war, the God of thunder, the God of this weather and that weather, I don't know what sort of relationship, if they had any relationship, I think it was more a kind of imploring, please come and help us, drive out our enemies with your hail and do this and do that. Well, here we have God as Father. We have God the Father Almighty. So he's not the God of this one thing. He's not the God of this one thing. He is the God of it all. He is Almighty. Creator of heaven and earth. Okay, so I had to speak to the bishop last week because I had an issue with this. And I couldn't believe that I was having to speak to the bishop with an issue about the Apostles' Creed. And I thought, I'm really not going to last very long. Um, uh, But she is so full of grace. So full of grace. I said, hey, 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 wait a minute. How comes the Father, is, we're being told in the creed, is the creator of heaven and earth, when just last week I got Jeff to get up and preach on the supremacy of Christ, that everything was created by Jesus, for Jesus, and Jesus holds all things together, creator of all things. John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, Jesus, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and he created all things. Here, in the creed, it says the Father created it all. She very wisely pointed me in the right direction. I very wisely listened. Um, And that is the Trinity, of course. The Trinity works in unison. I met with someone else this week, divine appointments. And they were saying, I was saying, whatever you do, don't get me to explain the Trinity. And they said, oh, I heard it explained recently. Uh, And I'm like, Really? And they said, yeah, it's like, this person explains it like it's one being with three persons. Oh, and I was like, I actually get that. Kind of. The thing about the Trinity is I kind of get it and I can explain it, but do I really understand it? I don't. I can explain the cross, the crucifixion. I can explain it to you about why it happened, how it happened, and what happened, but can I really get my head around it? Honestly, I can't. That a father would send his son to die for you and for me. I think we're lovely, but I don't think we're that lovely. And yet he does. And that is my weakness and my limitation. God's has, God has no limit. And I don't truly understand it. And actually, in the Western world, that is an issue for us because we like to have everything pinned down. We like to understand everything. And I think one of the wisest things you can ever do is recognize that you will not understand everything of the Lord. You cannot. He, he is that huge. He is that wise. He is that deep that we are just swimming in the shallows of our understanding of who this awesome God is. So do I understand the Trinity? Yes and no. I'm not trying to fudge the answer. I'm just being honest with you that, you know, I've been to theological college. I've had lots of answers, but none of them satisfy. I still don't truly understand. But I do know this, and this is what the bishop was getting at, that they work in unison. So, the God, so God the Father fulfills his plans through the Son and through the Holy Spirit. 
So uh, though it says that God created, the Father created heaven and earth, he did it through Jesus Christ, his Son. And you remember at the beginning, the Holy Spirit was hovering over the void. You see them all at work. And Jesus said um, to Philip, he said, show us the Father and we'll believe. And Philip said, uh, Jesus said, if you have seen me, you've seen the Father. I am in him and he is in me. And what are we told that with that? That when we would believe in Jesus, the Holy Spirit would come to live in us. And what does the Holy Spirit do? Apart from convicting us of sin, he teaches us everything that Jesus taught. Jesus said, I only do what my Father tells me. Can you see the Trinity at work in that? That Jesus is responding to the Father and the Holy Spirit is responding to Jesus. And they're all working in unison. Three, three individuals but one being. Three persons, one being. Anyway, I was pretty happy with what the bishop said, so I thought, thanks very much, put the phone down. That satisfied me. Uh, and in Jesus Christ, the only Son, our Lord. Okay, is Jesus God's only Son? No. The Bible tells us that when we believe, when we give our lives to Jesus, when we believe, we become sons of God. And that's whether you are male or whether you are female. It's a limit of the language. To be sons of God means that you are now heirs. That God has taken you and you are now in his family. You are then called a son, which meant only a son could inherit. Which means that you, whether you are male or female, when you believe in Jesus Christ, you become a son of God, an heir to everything that he has for you. So it's saying here that Jesus is God's only son. It looks, I wasn't doing very well at this point with the creed, like I've got another problem. But actually, if you go back to Genesis 22, you'll see Abraham is called by God to sacrifice Isaac. And he's he's told this, Go and sacrifice your son, your only son. The other word they use in in English translation is begotten. Begotten meaning only. And actually, it doesn't mean your only son because Isaac was not Abraham's only son. He He wasn't even his firstborn son. His firstborn and first son was called Ishmael. What it meant was, when by calling him his firstborn or only son, it was saying, bring the son of the promise. Uh, Isaac was promised by God. He was a son of a miracle. He was, uh, remember Abraham was like well old, well past having children. So was Sarah. So they just thought this will never happen. God did a miracle. She became pregnant. They had this son, but he already had another son. So it's about being the son that is set apart, the son that is unique. So when it talks about Jesus being the only son, it means the word from begotten or firstborn, it means the unique son, the son of the promise. Because when you read this, it can look pretty complicated, actually, if you don't know it, if you've got eyes that are fresh for that. So uh, we believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. Now, as we, we, live, we live in a liberal society. Uh, the Western uh, world over the last 50 years has got more and more liberal. And actually, a lot of priests have... Oh, I just want to say something before I forget. Uh, this is not Anglican. Okay, this is through all churches. This, this is... The Apostles' Creed is not for one denomination. It's for all denominations. Okay? So, a lot of priests, and the ones that I've heard of are Anglican priests uh, uh, um, in England, have um, rejected the idea of there being a virgin birth. Thinking it's just nonsense. That's just, that, that's just one miracle too far. That, you know, that's just a kid's story. Move on. It's in the Creed... And it's incredibly important. And the reason that it's not a kid's story and the reason that it's really important is because Jesus had to be born sinless. 
we, if Jesus had been born from Joseph and then had tried to live this perfect life, he would have fallen from the beginning because he would have been born sinful. Because when Adam sinned, sin entered the world, or actually when Adam rebelled, sin entered the world and contaminated everyone and everything so that everyone born after that was contaminated with the seed of sin. It went on and on and on and on. And what we were looking for, what God was looking for, was a perfect sacrifice to pay for all of our sin. And no one was found uh, eligible because everyone was born of the seed of sin. So God, through the Holy Spirit, Jesus was conceived. So he was conceived through perfection, sinlessness. He had to be born sinless and then he had to live a sinless life. So at the very end, when he came to the cross, he offered himself, he offered himself as a perfect sacrifice. So that he is coming as a perfect sacrifice, sinless, so that he could be acceptable to the Father, so that then uh, the atonement of that would fall on every single one of us, so we are washed clean as he is clean, so that we can stand before the Father without any blemish. Is that important? It is vital to the salvation story. It is vital to the salvation story. And it's the logic behind this is a miracle too far it is not logical. You, you have reason. We have reason, okay? And the, the idea that they could believe in the resurrection, which is impossible, but cannot believe in the virgin birth because that just seems too impossible, is crackers. It just doesn't make sense, does it? That, oh, I can believe that if I pray for someone, they'll be healed, and that's supernatural, that's God, that's fantastic. But do I believe that, you know, really, Jesus could feed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish? No, that's just, that's just crazy, that's just a kid's story. That's nonsense. If God can do impossible, how do you measure impossible? You can't. That's the logic behind it. So we believe in the... Uh, the uh, Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit, was born of Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. This is, what this does, it gives us a time and a place. It, historically, it means that this is not some sort of little Christian thing that Christians have put together and it just, you know, it doesn't mean anything to the world. It's a proof to the world that this happened at this time in history. That Pontius Pilate was around as a governor at this time and at this place and was, had authority over Jesus Christ and put him to death. It gives us a segment in time in history of when this happened. He was died, he died and was buried. In this version, it says he descended into hell. Shall I tell you something interesting? In more modern versions of the Apostles' Creed, that's taken out. Why is that taken out? Well, okay, so there's theological reasons why it could be taken out. There's theological arguments why it could be taken out. But actually, it brings to, to an interesting point that actually the church has almost lost its theology of hell. And the reason being is it's too painful. It doesn't sit well with a society that is pluralistic, that is all welcoming. The idea of hell just seems a punishment too far, and we can't really have anything to do with it. I've got to say, you've got to read your Bibles, because Jesus preached on hell regularly. He didn't go around slapping people around the head with it, but he came because of it, because we were all going to it. So he came to rescue us from it. If that is missing from your theology, you need to get your head in the word because it is real and it cost the life of our God. The Son of God died so that you and I would be rescued from the dominion of darkness and brought into the kingdom of light. It is very real. 
we don't like it and we don't want to go into it, I'm happy to go into it, as in, if you want to know about it, I'm happy to talk, well, I didn't know it, but you know, I'm happy to talk about it theologically and scripturally, but it's a reality. And actually, can I just quit very quickly say, it affects our evangelism. It does affect our evangelism because we lose our urgency. Because as a result of dropping hell, there's these, uh, well, I don't know what to call them, but these kind of myths that have seeped into churches that God is unconditional love. That's true. He is unconditional love, and he loves us unconditionally. The lie that has seeped into churches is because he loves us unconditionally, you will not go to hell. In fact, they don't even bother saying that anymore. Basically, you will be okay. God loves us unconditionally, and he sent his son to call us out of that place to follow him into the light. So that you, as a follower of Jesus Christ, come under a condition. The, not for love, you are loved whether you follow him or not, whether you believe in him or not, whether you hate him or not, you are unconditionally loved by him. He is love. It, there is, it, he cannot do anything else. But that doesn't mean that you are a follower of him. That doesn't mean that you're in with him. That doesn't mean that you have salvation. If that was the case, then we could all just go home. That is what we lose. So we lose an urgency. We lose an urgency that I've got to go and tell that person about Jesus. I've got to go and show that person Jesus by washing their feet. I've got to go and express the good news to that person because I, I, I love them and I want them to be saved. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring the good news, Isaiah tells us. It's for a reason. Uh, he, ascended, he ascended into heaven. That's where Jesus is now. He's at the right hand side of the Father. And what is he doing? He's putting his feet up and chillaxing. He's interceding for the saints. He's, he is praying for the saints. Who are the saints? A saint is anyone who has given their life to Jesus Christ and say, I want to follow you, I'm yours. That is a saint. He is interceding for us. And he's seated at the right-hand side of the Father. And he will come again to judge the living and the dead. How terrifying does that sound? He will come again to judge the living and the dead. We have just had Advent, just before Christmas, Advent is when we're looking for him to come and to judge the living and the dead. I believe that Judgment Day will be terrifying for those who do not know him. For those who know him, it will be glorious. Absolute glorious. I think it will be a total affirmation. A total blessing. Well done, my good and faithful servants. To be judged by the perfect judge... You can only get fairness there. You can only get justice there. And he's going to come to judge the living and the dead. Everyone will be held to account. Everyone will have to stand before him. It is a time of justice. It's beautiful. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Amen, 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 amen. So here we have the Trinity now. We've had the Father and the Son, and now we have the Holy Spirit. I believe the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, he is so misunderstood. And one of the things is, a lot of people in churches are afraid of the Holy Spirit, partly because we're told that he is like the wind. You can't really see him, and he does what he wants. He just goes where he wants. And so there's a bit of, we can't pin him down. So there's a bit of terror about that. He makes us vulnerable but he's got us. He, he encourages us and pushes us into places which are uncomfortable because he wants everyone to believe. He wants everyone to know 
about Jesus, the sacrifice, who brings the good news, who brings atonement and brings salvation to the world. He wants everyone to be in on that. So how are they, are they supposed to know? I've just said about Isaiah, we are the hands and feet that go out and tell them. And the Holy Spirit is constantly saying, go on, go on, share it with them. Tell them, go on, tell them about me, go on. And what we don't like about that is, that makes us look really stupid if nothing happens. And we get afraid of looking really stupid. So often what we do is we just ignore it. And we grieve the Holy Spirit. Because he's just seeing missed opportunity after missed opportunity as we hold on to our pride. There's no room for pride. He is lavish and he wants to pour himself out on everyone. Because the freedom that you are being offered that he is going to break every chain he wants for all of those around you. And you are the vessel through who that is going to happen. And he is going to be the one who turns up and does it. I recently heard a story. Uh, there's something in Bath called HOTS, which is healing on the streets. And uh, they, it's just a bunch of people, Christians, who go out and they put up uh, prayer flags. And they offer to pray for people. And people walk past and they offer to pray. And sometimes they want prayer and sometimes they don't. Is that a challenging thing to do? Yes. Is that an uncomfortable thing to do? Yes. Do they see the kingdom of God come and change people's lives? Yes. Yes, they do. And if you're not seeing the Holy Spirit work through you, bring a transformation to other people's lives, maybe you aren't stepping out further enough, far enough. So just one account recently... Uh, that I got via Facebook was that these guys went out and they went out to pray and there was a lady came past and uh, she was really struggling to walk and um, they said could we pray for you and she went mm, yeah and they prayed for her and um, nothing had happened but one of them had had a picture the Holy Spirit had revealed to one of them this picture and the picture was of a little girl sat on a uh, bale of straw out in an open field looking up to the sky smiling does that sound like the sort of word that you want to go and give to a stranger <laughs> no not really hey i've just had a really weird picture of a little girl on some straw looking up at the sky smiling does that mean anything to you it did she said i actually when i was a girl i grew up on a farm and I regularly used to go out and sit on a bale and look up the sky and just wonder at the world. And the guy said, well, I just believe that God has given me that to show you that he was fully aware of every time you went out to that bale that he was there. And she, she could just say, what a load of garbage on your way, old man. But she knew that God was in it. And she said, no, no, I get it. Yes, can you pray for me for healing? And then they prayed for her for healing, and someone else had another picture of an area of a body that she hadn't identified as being broken, and they said, I've just seen a picture of this. Does this mean anything to you? She said, yes, it does. They said, well, can we pray for it? She said, yes, you can. And she was healed physically. This is a woman who just at that point of just responding to a another person who has the Holy Spirit in them and has the courage to say, I have just seen this. Does it mean anything to you? Yes. Okay, let's pray. Next thing. Next thing. They didn't know what they were going to pray. They didn't know what the answers were. The Holy Spirit led them through it hand by hand, bit by bit, and she, in the end, is transformed and physically healed on the streets of Bath. Don't you want that? Isn't that what Jesus did? Isn't that what the apostles did? Isn't that what the Great Commission tells us to do? Don't you want to do it? Yes, you do. While we're sat in that I'm not sure place, nothing is happening. They are still walking around in darkness and in pain. This woman is still walking around in pain. When somebody, when one of you has the courage 
to let go of your pride and to step out and just say, okay, Holy Spirit, uh, let's go. You can see the kingdom of God come. It won't happen until you do it. Because you are the ones with the beautiful feet. Don't look. You are. This is your time. This is your moment. This is your opportunity. I believe in the Holy Catholic Church. It's not talking about Catholic as in the Catholics. It's talking about Catholic as in universal. That the church is the body of Christ universally and he is the head. That we are one church as believers. That is why this doesn't belong to any denomination. The communion of saints, that is the fellowship that we have, the communion of saints. Can you be a uh, Christian and live at home and never come in to a community of faith? Maybe you could be a Christian, but are you going to be walking in the strength of the Lord? Are you going to be, I guess, fighting fit? Is your faith going to be healthy? Is it going to be strong? Is it going to impact anyone else? No. Is it going to be really, really hard to every day deny yourself and follow Jesus from home? Yes, it is. If you are sick and you can't get in, then this is where this community heads out to go and bring blessing. But we are here together to meet together as brothers and sisters in Christ, to encourage each other, to build each other up in our faith, to strengthen each other, to bless each other, to challenge each other, to hold each other to account, and to love each other. It's glorious, and that is interdenomination. There's no like, oh, you're Baptist, so, you know, on your way. There's none of that. We are all brothers and sisters in Christ. The forgiveness of of sins. Your sins are forgiven when you give your life to Jesus Christ. But then you're going to go off and you're going to sin again. You're not going to want to. You're going to plan not to. You're going to put stuff in place so you don't do it. You're going to. All you have to do is come to your king and seek his forgiveness. The difficulty is, often we struggle to believe that we have been forgiven. And when you struggle to believe that you have been forgiven, you have a weight on you that you cannot shift. And let me tell you, it only gets heavier and heavier And so you are no longer living in the freedom that Christ offers you. Forgiveness is key to living the life that God has called us to. I remember just after I'd become a Christian, I screwed up and I felt really, really bad. And so I was like, oh, don't worry, you're forgiven. And I'm like, yeah, but I don't feel it. I just don't feel it. And when you're in that place of not feeling it, it's the devil's playground. He is all over it. He will just tread on you and keep you down. I'm unworthy. You're unworthy. You're unworthy. I am so unworthy. I don't deserve it. You don't deserve it. You deserve to be crushed. I deserve to be... And he just keeps you down. Though my sins are like scarlet, they will be washed as white as snow. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. Though your sins are like scarlet, says the Lord, I will wash them as white as snow. In the Psalms, we are told that he will remember our sins no more. If you confess your sin, you will be forgiven. The devil has no foothold on you. You can walk freely, and this is where the faith comes in, trusting that you have laid it at the cross of Jesus Christ and he has taken it from you and you can now stand in the presence of God. That will change your life. That will change your life. The forgiveness of 
sins. Can you imagine when this was originally put together, this information about these are all truths that God offers us and who he is going out into the world, in their pagan world, that this is the living God and this is the opportunity that you have? That not only have you got this loving God who you call Father, then this Son and the Holy Spirit who wants to work in you, who wants to bless you, but you can be forgiven for everything that you have done wrong. Continually. It is life-changing. It is beautiful. The resurrection of the body. Now, people get a bit bent out of shape about that because they're like, well, what if I get cremated? Does that mean that my body won't come up? What about people who are just like, if I um, put some ashes over here and I go to you know, British Columbia and drop some ashes, and you know, how, is, how does that work? Nothing is impossible for God. From dust we came, to dust we will go. On the day of resurrection, on the day of judgment, we will be raised. Those who have already fallen asleep will be raised up, and as will, that, will their physical bodies. God who formed them in the first place from nothing will form them again. That we will stand before God, not just in spirit, but in body too. But it will be redeemed. We will stand before God redeemed. And life everlasting. I don't know what life everlasting actually looks like. I've got to say, I don't know. Eternity with God. In my limited mind, I'm thinking, how boring is that? Like, what am I going to do every day? Uh, like, really? I know that some of the time I'm going to be fishing in the river of life. I know it. There's going to be some beauties in there. I'm going to be with my king. That is what I'm going to be. With my king, what could be better? I think time would just pass. We're restricted to time. God isn't. He can step in and out of time. It's something that limits us and not limits us. It, him. He is limitless. That, my friends, is the creed. Is there to uh, inform us of what we believe as Christians. It is a tiny morsel of the full picture of who God is and who he's called you and me to be. It is the tiny, a tiniest of morsels. But it's enough to keep you on the straight and narrow and to know what it is you believe. And you may wrestle with some of it. There's nothing wrong with wrestling. As long as you are submissive when he says, when he opens it up to you and says, told you so. It's about a relationship that a Father God wants to have with you and me. That is our creed. Amen.